Good morning. Good morning. The congregation sat quietly. We welcome you to our service today. This is the first Sunday in the Advent season. Jane will not be here today playing the organ. She is helping her mother with some uh, medical things that are coming up over the next couple of days. And we have a guest organist here today. He's been up all night, I've been told, practicing on the organ to, to bring uh, us our accompaniments today. So thank you, Glenn, for doing that. Um, before we start, I thought I'd give you some uh, kind of uh, information that we don't always share with, with people. You know, during the Advent season now, today we're going to be decorating the church fo uh, for Christmas following the service. And there are a lot of symbols that go along with that. You'll see that on the tree. I can't really tell you yet uh, what the, all those symbols stand for. But one of the things that we have during the Advent season is, if you notice that today I'm just wearing the black robe instead of the white robe over that. Does anyone know the reason for that? There is a symbolism that's involved with that. The black was traditionally worn because we are sinful people, reminding us of our sin before the Lord. And for many of you, probably while you were growing up, that's all you saw, uh, that the ministers were wearing black robes. Uh, in later years now, they've been wearing more white robes, probably about the last 20 years or so. The idea there was returning to those robes that were prominent really in the early Christian church. For me, as I was uh, entering the ministry, I uh, was reminded so much of my ministers when I was very young, and they wore the black robe and the white robe on top of that. Is that the same for some of you? The white robe symbolizes the righteousness of Christ, his holiness, as it now covers us in the blackness of our sin as our savior. So why am I wearing the white robes at the present. Well, the Advent season and the Lenten season are preparation, are preparation seasons for the holidays of our Savior, for his birth and then for his death and resurrection. And during those seasons as preparations, the emphasis really is upon preparing oneself to receive the blessings that Christ has won for us. It's a season of repentance. And so traditionally, you would take off the white robe then to remind us once again that it was our sin that caused our Savior to have to come into this world and to go the way of the cross for us. So during a season of repentance, you might see ministers remove the white robes. And then as the holiday season came, whether that be Christmas, Epiphany, or Easter, then the white robe was replaced. So there is that symbolism that goes along with our services that we don't often share with our people. So over the next several Sundays, you will see the black robe. And you'll notice in our lessons that the emphasis will be upon that time of preparation to receive our Lord, knowing that as a Savior, he came to fulfill our greatest needs. In your bulletin today, another form of symbolism, if you would take out uh, the blue insert that you have there. During the Advent season, one of the customs in these later years is to have an Advent wreath, but sometimes people aren't aware of what that Advent wreath is all about. So we'll explain that over the next several weeks also. On the front side of it, you see the lighting candles at Advent. I will let you read that on your own. That gives a background to all of this. Basically, the candles stand for today and for this season. They stand for the different gifts that the Lord gives to us as he comes as our Savior. And this first candle today is designated as a candle of love. There are many different names, several different names that have given, been given to these candles in the Advent wreath. But this year we'll follow the fruits of the Spirit, the blessings that our Lord gives to us in his coming. So if you would uh, look on the second side where it says the first candle, love, and then join with me in the congregational reading that is in the bold print. The first candle that we light today has been called the candle of love to symbolize the love of God revealed to us during this season. God the Father presented to us the full measure of his love by giving his only begotten son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
God the Son showed us the great extent of his love by laying down his life for us. For greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And God the Holy Spirit gives each believer the capacity to love as a gift and fruit of faith to all who are in Christ. As it was said of the early Christians, behold how they love one another. To the extent that our Lord dwells in each of us by faith, he blesses us with his love and teaches us to exercise love in return. So may the love of God reveal to us this season, compel us to love as he so greatly loved us. If you would join with me in the reading. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. You are my friends if you do what I command. For you did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. This is my command, love each other. And we pray. Dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through whom the blessings of redemption flow by faith to every sinner, forgive us our sins and increase our faith this Advent season, that we might know the full extent of your redeeming love for us. Give us also the capacity to love as you have loved us, so that your purposes for us, your disciples, may never be thwarted, but find fulfillment through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we now continue in our service this morning. We follow the order of setting one for Holy Communion. That will be on page 154. But the service begins with the singing of our opening hymn, hymn number 309. As again, we follow the order of setting one for the service of Holy Communion. You'll find that on page 154. And we ask the congregation to speak the responses or sing them as they are in the bold print for you throughout the service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature 
and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we take a moment of silence to reflect on those words. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we continue on page 156. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, and let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be to God on the high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you. We glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world. Receive our prayer. You sit at the right hand of God the Father. Have mercy on us. For you only are holy. You only are the Lord. You only, O Christ, with the Holy Spirit, are most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. 
For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. And we now turn our attention to the scripture lessons that are appointed for today. Again, it is the first Sunday in Advent. Advent means coming, and it's very typical in our lessons for this season that three comings generally are talked about. That is our Lord's first coming at his birth into this world. Think of that as the coming of grace, as God sent his son in love to redeem us. Then there is the second coming that is often pointed to, as has been the case the past several weeks, but our season begins with that also. That refers to Jesus coming at the end of time. Think of that as the advent of judgment. And then the third coming is one that, that takes place every day as the Lord comes to us through word and sacraments to create that faith within our hearts as in him as a savior. Think of that as the advent of faith. So our lessons today will center on actually all three of those to some extent. Um, we begin in the lesson from Jeremiah Chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, the Lord is prophesying that he has to raise up a new covenant. Think of that as the gospel, because his people were not able to keep the old covenant, which was of the law. So this is the covenant of grace that he promises in the Savior to come. We read in Jeremiah 31. Yes, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant of mine, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor or each one teach his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their guilt and I will remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson today is the epistle lesson from Romans chapter 13 beginning at verse 11 through verse 14. At first, you might think that this is in regards to Christ's second coming at the end of time, and it is. But it actually is referring to his coming to us now in the present time that we might be prepared for it when he returns again at the end. We read in Romans chapter 13. And do this since you understand the present time. It is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost over, and the day is drawing near. So let us put away the deeds of darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let us walk decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual sin and wild living, not in strife and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not give any thought to satisfying the desires of your sinful flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now before the reading of the gospel, we join in the singing of the gospel acclamation. You'll find that on page 161 in the front of the hymnal, page 161. And with the beginning now of the Advent Christmas season, we use the Advent portion for the seasonal verse. To us, Emmanuel, come and set your people free. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. 
The gospel lesson for today is recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, reading verses 1 through 9. It has been a tradition, going way back in history, to read on the first Sunday in Advent, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. At first, that might seem a little strange, because you think of that in the Lenten season. But it is the idea that our king is coming to us, as he was prophesied in, in the Old Testament times. Now, he has fulfilled that. We read in Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples telling them, Go to the village ahead of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied there along with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you are to say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their outer clothing on them, and he sat on it. A very large crowd spread their outer clothing on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them out on the road. The crowds who went in front of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated for the singing of our next hymn. We join in the singing of hymn 713. 713, this reflects a little bit more the epistle lesson for the day. Interesting to have a computer play the song for you. <laughs> uh, that, that one caught me off guard, that, that last stanza there. But the first two stanzas were rather fast, so I needed a big breath anyway. <laughs> it is a blessing, though, to have that play, you know, um, 
Otherwise, you'd have me on the piano, perhaps. <laughs> so we'll turn our attention now to the epistle lesson for today. It's from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Now I'm going to read from what is known as the New International Version of the Scriptures. So not quite exactly the same as on the back side of your bulletin. Paul writes, do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy and strife. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed in our Lord, if you will allow me, I'm going to go back 10 days. 10 days ago was Thanksgiving. I woke up early on Thanksgiving at 4 a.m. because I was on turkey duty. It was my job to cook the turkey that day, and it was a big bird. It would take at least four and a half hours for that to bake. I knew I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep after I wrestled that bird into the oven, so I went up to my study to review the lessons that were coming up, especially for the Advent season. I had several hours to wait. Well, in my study at home, some of you have probably seen that, there are three windows that face out to the east. They give to me a good amount of, of natural light and also a very small view of the countryside or the horizon. And as I sat at those windows, I then re began to review the lessons, and especially the lessons for this Sunday here. This one in the epistle from Romans 13. And the words just struck me. It was quite, quite striking to me at the time that I was reading them. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. This is early in the morning. The night is nearly over. The day is almost near. Put aside the deeds of darkness. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is figurative language, right? It compares faith in Christ to awakening from sleep and rising, to the passing from night into day, and then also to the activities that take place under the cover of darkness where people cannot see what is going on to that which is done in the light. My first thoughts on this centered on what we call Jesus' second advent. When he comes again in the brightness of all his glory on the last day, on judgment day. At that time the dawn of a new heavenly era with our Lord is going to break upon the darkness of sin and that will be banished forever. At his return, Christ is going to receive to himself in his heavenly kingdom all who believe in him as their savior. And he will condemn to hell all those who have rejected him and walked in this world of darkness and sin and unbelief apart from him. Well, in thinking of that last day, an eerie type of feeling swept over me. As I looked outside into the darkness yet, the first rays of light began to be seen on the distant horizon. The night was nearly over. The day was almost here. As the minutes passed, the light grew stronger. And although the sun had not yet appeared by 6.45 in the morning, there was this strong reddish glow on the horizon. And the objects outside my window became a little bit more clear and into full view. The night was nearly over. The day was almost here. A car or two passed through the neighborhood that early in the morning. <clears throat> and I wondered... <laughs> where the people had been. Maybe they were coming early for Thanksgiving with relatives or friends, or maybe they had been out all night also. 
and the verse took on significance. The night is almost over. The day is drawing near. The hour has come for you to wake up. What if that day, 10 days ago, was the start of the second advent of Christ, the advent of judgment? What if after the sunlight had broken, a loud trumpet blast came from the skies and a brilliant light was seen, more brilliant than the sun? The Lord Jesus shining in all of his heavenly glory, coming with all of his holy ones surrounding him. And all nations are then going to be gathered before him. He's going to separate the people from one another, just like a shepherd separates his sheep. Believers on the right, unbelievers on the left. What if the end of the world was actually going to take place as I was looking upon this and reading of this? Were we ready for heaven's eternal judge to appear? Were people awake or were they asleep? And I don't mean physically, but spiritually. It would have been time for the end right then. Well, we're here at 10 days later. So obviously, the Lord Jesus was not coming back at that time. And he hasn't come back yet today. Maybe tonight. Who knows? Someday soon, he says, it will be. But this text is not so much about the end of time and the advent of judgment as it is about the present and the advent of grace. It is now. It is meant not as much to warn us about what lies ahead, but this text is really here to exhort, to incite, to urge us onward in this life of faith in Christ that we have now, because his light has dawned upon us in the fulfillment of himself as the Savior. Paul writes elsewhere about this, saying, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. The time is now, know that. Understand the present time, is what Paul writes here. It's almost like saying, open your eyes, people. Look around you. See what is here. Understand. Look what you have. A Savior prophesied to the people of old, but he has been fulfilled in his coming in these latter days. God's new covenant is complete. How are you living in it? See, Paul is urging us in this text to keep growing in our understanding of Christ's advent, his advent of faith in the present in our lives. Wake up! Put aside the deeds of darkness, he says. Put on the armor of light. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses figurative words to help us grasp the spiritual thoughts and reality of life in him. You know, people rise up from their sleep at night in order to make some type of temporal gain during the day from their work. When the night has given place to morning, they take up a day's work. Whatever that might be, they take it up in order to accomplish something. If that is true, how much greater the necessity is for us then to awake from our spiritual sleep, to cast off the dark deeds of Satan that he would have us do, and to enter into those works that the Lord would have us do. Christ, the light of the world, the Savior from sin, whom we so desperately needed, has now come to us. Our night of unbelief, that night of sin, in a sense, is past, as Christ fulfills all for our salvation. And now is our day of salvation, faith in it, in Christ. That is here. It has eternally dawned upon us already. In that faith, we are children of the light. 
Paul writes, once we were in darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then again, he writes to the Thessalonians, but you brothers are not in darkness. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Let us be alert, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. It's time now for us to do this. Not tomorrow, not next week, not a month from now. But in this hour is what Paul writes. Now, the night has passed, the day has broken. It is the day of our salvation in Christ. The gospel lightens every man and woman and child who believes. But why does Paul encourage us with these words? Because we already believe. Well, none of us ever gets to the point of faith and knowledge where it is not necessary for us to be encouraged. While we are here, there is the danger of our untiring enemies against us. That is the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. They want us to fall into these deeds of darkness that Paul enumerates. And you know the meaning of these words. These don't even have to be explained to you. Orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, debauchery, dissension, strife, jealousy. That's not hard to understand the references which Paul is making here to the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh that they never stop throwing at us while we're here in life. Aren't the signs that Paul talks about here, along with many others, aren't they prevalent in our world today? Sometimes it seems like there's hardly any decency left in our world, the way people live. So much of our entertainment, just the commercials themselves, are geared to promoting sin, even among our children. And how about the strife and the quarreling that's going around in our world at the present and really in every age. And maybe even some of you experience that on a personal level. The hour is late. The Lord Jesus is coming again soon. Therefore, arm yourself against these enemies of the cross. As Peter said, your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Be watchful. You know, Paul thinks in a very similar way to Peter. We need continuous encouragement, since the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh is constantly assailing us. We need an exhortation to that vigilance. So he said... Put on the whole armor of light and walk in the light of the Lord. Do this, he encourages, understanding the present time. The hour has come. The time for Christian activity in life is now. So clothe yourself with Christ, Paul says, and get ready for that new day that will soon dawn. Do it now. Do it today. A Christian ought to live in the present as he would want to be found by his Lord on that last day. What we do and how we treat others and how we look towards our Lord is a reflection of our preparation and faith in him. How are we doing? In the year that lies ahead, we begin a new church year today. We're going to face two choices many times. Will you be caught in spiritual sleep and carelessness and indifference or in the awareness of Christ and the life that is yours in him by faith now? So tomorrow, when the sun begins peaking up over the horizon. Think of Paul's words. 
understand the present time, for the hour has come for us all to wake up from any slumber because our salvation is now nearer than it was when we first believed. God grant that in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And if you would take out your hymnals and turn to page 162 in the front. We join together with all Christians in confessing our faith. This morning we do that in the words of the Nicene Creed. Page 162. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated, but if you would keep your hymnals open and to page 164 as we join in the responsive prayer of the day. Page 164. <clears throat> Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments faith may grow, and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science the arts, and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. And now hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. And this morning we also give a prayer on behalf of Pastor Daniel Fry whom we have called several weeks ago to come and be our pastor here in at Peace in Marshfield. 
We thank you, Heavenly Father, for using us as instruments in your service to extend a divine call for another pastor. Bless Pastor Dan Fry with the wisdom and maturity he needs to consider where to serve you and your people. We trust that your Holy Spirit will bring us the very servant we need as we seek to serve you at this time and in this place. And Lord, we remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. And we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to him. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Lord, you awaken us every day to your mercies that come to us and flow to us in so many different ways. You provide for all our daily and physical needs. Most of all, you have provided for our spiritual needs through the coming of Christ, our Savior. In this Advent season, may we prepare our hearts and minds to receive him in joy and in faith that grows so that every day we are ready for your return. We ask that you would bless the offerings that we bring to your altar today, use them to your glory, and so that this gospel of the kingdom might be preached in the world to prepare people for your coming. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. And we now continue in the order of Holy Communion on page 165. Page 165. And also with you, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him a thanks and a praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we join in the prayer the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Oh, Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Oh, Christ, Lamb of God, You take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. And we now invite our communicant members to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Please follow the direction of our ushers. And during the distribution, we'll join in the singing of hymn 661. Draw near and take the body of the Lord.
kept for you for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood has given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins. Strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. body and blood have given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins. Strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Please rise as we continue at the closing of the communion service on page 170. Now towards the middle of the page, page 170 with the responsive versicles and the blessing. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn. We join together in singing hymn number 928.
I'm reminded of years ago. You know, over the last several days, I've been uh, thinking of things of the past since uh, it's been a while since uh, we have been here. And uh, today I was thinking, with a different organist playing for us today, there was a time, probably only Noreen remembers this, that we had four organists in the congregation. Uh, that was quite a while ago, probably about 30 years ago, I think it was. And uh, what, I, what, what I was reminded about today is that, you know, every pianist, every organist plays things differently. And uh, I noticed that in the, in the tracks that we have for the hymns. So some play a little bit faster. <laughs> some of that was pretty fast today. Some play a little bit slower. Um, but the, those who have uh, helped out in, in creating this for congregations that don't have an, an organist, we're blessed to at least have the one organist. And we're so used to, to following along with her rhythm and that. It's been over the years that we're so used to that. Uh, to have another one come in and play a different uh, type of style and rhythm is a little bit different. But those are the gifts that God gives to his people, and they're a blessing to us, and, and so uh, uh, we'll enjoy that. But it is interesting uh, to see how the Lord works through all of that. So we invite you to remain following our service today for a time of fellowship and refreshments. Make sure you look at the announcements for today. If you haven't picked up the meditations booklet, it started already a couple days ago. No, today. Today, it is, yes, on Sunday. Uh, for the new series for the next three months. There's also a set of Advent devotions there that has been put together by our uh, professors and pastors at uh, Martin Luther College up in uh, New Ulm area. And uh, this afternoon, not this afternoon, following the service, following refreshment time, we'll do the decorating of the church for Christmas. So we hope you can uh, uh, stay for that. God bless your week that lies ahead. Thank you.